All right, guys, we're just about to get started, so if you're out there in the uh, event center, come on in. Uh, there was one thing I forgot to announce. If you just look for the, the team that's in the safety yellow green construction worker shirts almost, that's what they tell me I made them wear. Um, that's, that's the conference staff. You can grab anybody. If you have any questions, concerns, talk to them, um, and they'll, they'll make sure it gets taken care of. So I'm just really excited uh, uh, this morning, as you can tell from earlier, but uh, I'm very excited about this next speaker. Uh, the fact that he took the time out of his busy schedule to come down here and support the conference and support us is, is just a real honor. And um, I'd just like to give him a brief introduction before we get up here. So Dave has served as Chief Executive Officer of FireEye since November 2012 and Chairman, Chairman of the Board since May of 2012. Um, as many of you probably know in this field, uh, he led FireEye to one of the most successful cybersecurity IPOs and is involved in defining an entirely new approach to security uh, and information security protection. Um, prior to FireEye, Dave served as President and Executive Officer and Director of McAfee. Uh, this was from April 20, 2007 through August 2011, and uh, at which time he led uh, McAfee to be acquired by Intel, and I think it was the largest cash acquisition in tech history. So uh, very, very impressive. Um, He's held various executive positions throughout his career uh, and served um, on, uh, so sorry, <laughs> he was uh, uh, positions at EMC Corporation from December 2003 to March 2007 after the company was acquired, um, at, at Documentum I think was acquired, sorry, where he had served as president and chief exec executive officer from July 2001 to December 2003. Uh, he currently sits on the board of directors for Delta Airlines, the University of San Francisco, uh, the National Security Technology Advisory Council for President Obama, and Five Nine. He previously served on the board of directors of Polycom from November 2005 to May 2013, and as its chairman of the board from May 2010 to May 2013, as well as board of directors of Jive Software from February 2011 to April 2013. Dave holds a BS in computer science from the University of Delaware, and I'd like you to help me give him a very warm welcome Mr. Dave DeWalt, Chairman and CEO of FireEye. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Awesome. Good morning. How's everybody? Yeah. Well, Shaka Khan 6, I just want to say thank you, honestly, to Secure DNA and sort of all the folks, Jason and Ernie and the whole team here, six years of putting this on together what great professionals they are, great people. Will you give them a big round of applause? Give Jason one, too. Thank you, Jason. Awesome. All right. I was really looking forward to coming to Honolulu and doing a presentation. I, I get a chance to speak all over the world sometimes, and uh, rarely do I get to do it right outside Waikiki's beach. And I'm wondering why we're not out there doing the presentation at the moment, but um, kind of fun to be in here as well, and uh, just want to welcome, hopefully everybody can see me okay. Um, I think the bio is going to be longer than my presentation, so apologies for, for that. Um, I was going to go on, when I was age eight, I wrote my first program, and uh, well, we missed that in the bio. Anyways, hey, um, I'm going to try to talk on a serious note today about kind of what's happening in the world. I know a lot of you are, are very seasoned uh, security professionals. Uh, I have a technical background and been um, really uh, interested in technology since I was a, a little kid. And uh, it's amazing kind of what we're dealing with in the world today. Just absolutely amazing. And uh, it's a little ominous title that I have up here, sort of the dawning of cyber wars. Uh, but uh, I've really seen an incredible amount of evidence to suggest that we, we really are on the precipice of some pretty dangerous times in the world. Um, if you think back about what's happened over, over mankind's history, whenever a new domain is discovered, typically mankind has a conflict over it. You know, whether it was the uh, lands or oceans or air or space or, or now cyberspace, we end up finding ourselves really with conflict. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, when, I, when I first got involved with some of the, the global superpower conflicts that are happening, I was the CEO of McAfee. And uh, in 2008, we had a, a pretty famous operation called Aurora. Anybody remember Aurora? Pretty interesting attack. 
Uh, we were involved with it at McAfee and ultimately discovered that Google had been hacked and we'd gone in and seen some of the evidence of how the JPEGs were loaded down, the spear phishing occurred, who they were targeting, how they were going after the systems. And over the course of about a 30-day period, we ended up finding 153 companies with a very similar attack, all in Silicon Valley, all focused on source code, uh, bug databases, uh, kind of quality assurance systems. And we realized for the first time how long the attacks had been in place, what the research was going after, and just you know how powerful the system ultimately was. I found myself uh, being invited to the White House uh, about 30 days later, and um, President Obama had just gotten in office beginning of 2009, and my job was to brief the president on what had happened with Operation Aurora. So here I am presenting you know, what malware is and APTs are to the president of the United States. I, I literally was like, you know, pinch me. It was a pretty amazing time. But you know, fast forward six years later, and we're giving briefings to the premiers and presidents all over the world on what's happening in cyber. And uh, we've just elevated from one DEF CON level to another. And uh, we've now arrived at uh, indictments of major military officers in China. Most of you have probably seen it. It's a pretty serious situation we're all in. So I want to kind of paint this for you and give you a little insight to what I see around the world. I have a pretty interesting view to what's happening you know, with travels, uh, um, not only with FireEye, but also with the National Security Council. Also my views from safety and security of Delta Airlines and to sort of how physical and cyber terrorism and security are coming together. And uh, tell you a little bit about what the offense is doing, how uh, powerful that offensive model has become, uh, in many ways how weak the defensive model has become and how dislocated it's been, and then ultimately a little of kind of where it's all going. So um, I like to start off with an analogy. Many of you uh, probably know this analogy pretty well. Uh, I love history, uh, hopefully some of you do too. And I think history is repeating itself literally right now in cyberspace. And the analogy that I like to use comes from um, post-World War I. Uh, it's called the Maginot Line. And uh, many of you know what occurred. Uh, if you don't, in 1929, the uh, French had proposed André Maginot, who was the war minister of France, uh, proposed to the French parliament a 9 billion French franc uh, defense system. At the time, 9 billion French francs was nearly the economy for that year. And uh, this was a serious undertaking. Uh, you probably know it was the greatest defense system that uh, the world had ever seen that was about to be built. Uh, this was a series of forts that were essentially put in place every three quarters of a mile. And uh, they were fortified. It was an incredible architecture that was created. Uh, this thing was uh, never seen before. Every learning of World War I was essentially put in place with this defense system. How to overcome gas attacks, how to have ground forces be put in place for years, how to marshal attacks. If you look at sort of the architectures that are put in place, sorry if you can't see it in the back, but it was incredible. You know, literally air pressure gas chambers, uh, all kinds of long sustaining, you know, up to a decade long sustaining operations. Uh, complete hangars built into the, the bays, uh, tank commands, you know, tunnels coming in, telecommunication systems, gymnasiums, medical systems. Uh, this thing was uh, a work of art. And probably what's most amazing about it, it was never used. Most of you probably know this. Um, the uh, uh, ultimate defense went all the way from the English Channel all the way down to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, literally every three quarters of a mile. Pretty impressive uh, system. Uh, there's actually two of them that was built, the Maginot and the Alpine line, one across Italy and another across the, the French border. And uh, most of you probably know this, when the Second World War was, uh, was done, uh, the Germans with superior technology bypassed the Maginot line in literally days and occupied Paris in six weeks from the outbreak of the war. So nine billion French francs, greatest defense system ever built and uh, built from the previous kind of war and ultimately defeated in days. So what I kind of see happening today is almost the same Maginot Line kind of analogy. Most companies are putting in place a very complicated, complex defense in depth model. 
And at every layer of the architecture of the network and the endpoint in the cloud, we're building incredible architectures, advanced next generation firewalls, you know, proxies for the web gateways, the email gateways, intrusion detection prevention systems, data loss prevention systems, all kinds of SQL injection systems, and the list goes on and on. The average company, Fortune 500 company, spending, spending over $100 million a year in defense in depth. Pretty amazing numbers. What's the reality? We're seeing almost the same thing. Superpowers are bypassing these defense architectures in minutes. Literally in minutes. Most of you probably saw the uh, APEC event that was here uh, not too long ago. Uh, the attacks can occur literally in hours and be successful, some of which uh, Mandiant and FireEye responded to, to some of the delegation that was speaking at the APEC event here in Honolulu were breached to find what? Speaker notes. What were they speaking about? So the abilities to be able to breach these complex systems is so easy today. It's, it's kind of scary. The offense and the defense are completely dislocated. And it goes back to almost what happened in World War I going into World War II. The architectures that we have in place are creating a massive hole. They all have an Achilles heel. And the understanding of, hey, I've got antivirus. I put in these defense in depth layers. Somebody's going to find it. I've got 30, 40, 50 different security vendors. I put in all this technology. And of course, I'm secure. And the reality is most companies are not secure. And we're seeing that more than 95% of the organizations are compromised. They're completely owned. Uh, their data exfiltration is massive. And they're failing to protect their core IP. So we're now at the dawning of just a major shift in terms of power, uh, complexity, ingenuity to go after and attack this type of model. And the offense is getting much more aggressive than the defensive models that are there. And of course, we try to uh, respond to these threats. But at the heart of it is a system. Most of you know it. I was part of it for, for almost five years at McAfee. Uh, we built these systems, the antivirus model, blacklisting, signature pattern matching kinds of models. And what would we try to do? Figure out how to match a virus. Uh, we'd write a signature for it. We'd write thousands of them every day. We release our data engines you know, multiple times a day. And uh, we'd send them out to every computing device. McAfee had nearly 300 million computing devices that we would deploy it to. And we would send these out and ultimately became 60 plus million signatures that were updating every day. And of course, the effectiveness of this system is not very high today. In fact, I'll show you in a minute, it's in single digit effectiveness. And what do we do? We put that different antivirus model from McAfee or Symantec or Trend Micro or Kaspersky, Sophos, name a vendor, or an IPS solution, something at the firewall, and we put this model in place everywhere, 25 year old model that has single digit effectiveness. And when you look at what's happened, you're seeing that the average breach from the time of infection to the time of discovery is 243 days. This was over almost 1,000 incidences that we responded to over the last two years. The average infection, 243 days. From the time it was placed to the time we discovered it, and then ultimately another about 32 days it took from the time of discovery to the time of remediation. So 270 plus days to go from time of breach to figure it out. What's most interesting is 63% of those companies learned about it from someone else. They couldn't discover it with their own technologies. It came from an agency, uh, came from a private vendor, and almost all of them, 100% of them, had up-to-date antivirus, and most of them had it at every layer of the architecture. And I'll show you some stats here in just a minute. It's kind of an interesting state of things, spending $100 million a year on average Fortune 500 company, and ultimately 98% of them or so are breached, most of them are finding out from a third party, and most of them have the attacks in the network for almost a year. It's kind of the state of reality of what we're seeing out in the market. So at FireEye, we did a little study just to kind of prove what we were, what we were seeing. In a combination of Mandiant and FireEye, we looked at uh, 1,217 companies over the course of about a 100-day period. And this was just done recently um, from about December till May. 
And we did it across uh, 1,614 appliances at FireEye, 67 different countries. So this was the first time that we looked at a network, either through an incident response or through a FireEye appliance. And the reality of it was quite interesting. We ended up doing it across a lot of different verticals, financials, high tech, government, uh, banking, across the board. Again, 67 countries, 20 verticals. And what did we end up seeing? 120,000 unique pieces of malware, 75%, 75% of them were seen one time. So what are the attackers doing today? They write the malware very uniquely targeted at the company. So 1,217 companies, of all the malware, three quarters of them were seen once. So interesting, and about 18% detection rate across all of that. And most of that detection rate was across a 30-day period. The antivirus vendors found it 0% of the time in the first two or three days. And then ultimately, about a 30-day period, they discovered about 18% of it. So kind of an interesting state of things. When you sort of look at kind of the summary of that, you end up seeing the numbers like this. One-fourth of them, about 25%, saw an APT, a persistent uh, advanced attack. Uh, about 75% of them saw active command and control server activity, which was using data exfiltration. Almost 100% of them used foreign cryptography, so no SSL-type connection. All, um, all types of cryptography used. And, of course, the average attack was very regular at uh, several times a week. So these are kind of the state of things that we had saw. And then when you kind of look at all of them, almost 100% of them had firewalls, web, network, endpoint, and other anti-malware type solutions on the host. So elaborate technologies, nearly 100% of them breached, most of them having data exfiltration, 67 countries, 20 verticals, 1,000 plus customers. My point of it is, it's kind of the Maginot line that we're seeing. The state of cybersecurity offense is far ahead of the defensive model right now. And when you sort of start to look at what's the mode of operandi of some of the superpowers, you'll get an understanding of why this is going to just increase as we move forward. There's no doubt that these numbers will continue to increase. We're seeing it regularly. And the ultimate state of things is this. You're starting to see the headlines, and almost ultimately, you're seeing what I think is the greatest transfer of wealth in history happening. Most of it's happening from America and the Western world to the emerging markets. But the intellectual property, the dollar theft, is now measured in hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Hundreds of billions a year. Pretty interesting. So when you sort of surmise this all, you go like, why is it happening? What's causing this? And what I find really interesting is we have almost the perfect platform of evil that got created. In a great way, all this wonderful innovation that we have is amazing. Every couple months, I have a new cell phone. I'm always connecting on social networks. We all are. We all have all this wonderful information at our disposal, but it's created literally the perfect platform for the adversaries to leverage. And I'm sure over the course of the next couple of days, you'll see that. But what are we finding? Cyberspace itself, this new domain that we have, is tremendously flawed from a defensive point of view. Why? Because we have no governance model. We're one click away from any website in the world. Any search can connect to just about any domain. 95% of all the domains are in the darknet today. IPv6 and driving towards the new types of topologies we have on the network are adding trillions of addressable devices. And ultimately, we have complete anonymity on the internet. So the attackers can hide behind whatever IP address they happen to buy. And now, with capitalism, we can buy domains for 3 to $5, and we can buy tens of thousands of them without any identification. So kind of an interesting world we're living in where we've got this perfect platform set up, and of course, most of the adversaries are the governments themselves. The superpowers are the ones that are driving these activities. And if it's not directly the superpowers, it's someone acting on behalf of the superpowers. So this isn't going to change anytime soon. So kind of an interesting situation that we're leveraged in as we move forward. 
So think about this from a couple vectors, and this is what I find most interesting. What's going to happen? What's the dark side of this innovation? Kind of think about this in four areas. Probably number one, the cyber espionage kind of components expand. The number of countries that we're tracking now that have offensive activities probably is in the 51 or 52 country range right now. This is up from about eight or 10 three years ago. We believe there's about 51 countries right now that have put in place vulnerability research labs, put in offensive teams, funded those teams, and those teams are very active when it comes to offensive espionage. And that spread pretty virally across the world. Uh, part of the report that I mentioned, the Maginot Line, we now track command and control servers in 204 countries. I actually didn't know there was 204 countries. Um, that's a huge number of hosted domains that are using data exfiltration models and leverage with their telecommunication systems for um, exfiltration of information. So we're going to continue to see this. Uh, the amount of recruitment coming out of the military in most of the countries around the world is extreme. When we see the Syrian and the Iranian activities and how much they're improving every couple of months, you can see the knowledge transfer that's occurring into these parts of the marketplace. And I'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Probably the biggest change we're seeing recently is some of the cyber sabotage types of uh, malware kits. Um, no intent whatsoever to steal. The entire intention is to destroy. We've seen several cases in the United States just in the last uh, 60 to 90 days, some of which were very high profiled, one involving one of the largest casinos in Las Vegas due to a comment the CEO made about a particular country, ultimately uh, came about with a massive attack in four days. So in this particular attack, high-end data destruction types of uh, worms were deployed, ultimately with a spear phishing front end but was able to be put together in a four-day period. That brought down the company for five straight days. So kind of an interesting time where the motivations are not only just uh, for crime or for intellectual property, but now for hatred, religious purposes, other types of geopolitical purposes as well. Other types of things, the crime element has really hit the equity markets. So most of you probably see this. Uh, a lot of change has occurred from what I think of as high volume, low credit card, low dollar amount types of crime, still made famous by Target and a few others, but we're seeing a tremendous amount of insider trading types of activities today, and a lot of hedging off that insider trading information. A lot of the breach responses we're doing, we only find three or four or five uh, breached uh, hosts, and what are those hosts um, people doing? financial controllers, investment relations personnel, anybody who has high access to information. So the whole idea, get access to the information, hedge the stock, hedge the commodities, get information ahead of the market, make money that way. Very, very difficult to track that. We have very little regulation in place to do it. And most of the attackers are using bank accounts somewhere in the world with a number of degrees of anonymity. So a tremendous amount of change in the way in which the crime element's occurring as well. And a lot happening in the Eastern European marketplace today. The last one, which is probably the more frightening one, which I had experienced with directly, is a bit of the accidental problem. With all this activity that's occurring from so many different groups, we now track about 300 offensive actors in the world, just to give you a size. Over 300 motivated groups, most of them are playing now with very, very um, interesting areas of the operating environments of the stacks that we all you know, find comfort in. The BIOS uh, elements of our, of our infrastructure, our critical infrastructure, whether it's our transportation in the sky, transportation on the ground, uh, critical energies, and a lot of the activity is directly related to trying to monitor it, uh, steal from it, and of course, the slightest mistake can cause an accident. And we've seen a number of scenarios that are this close to creating an accident. And some of the accidents can actually occur from the security vendors themselves or from the vendors trying to patch it in an emergency patch kind of way. Uh, I don't know if you follow FireEye too much, but we just released a, a major zero day in Internet Explorer a couple of weeks ago called Clandestine Fox. 
clandestine fox was a zero day we discovered in one of our incident responding areas. It, it hit not only XP, but all the way through all the Microsoft platforms. Microsoft was absolutely amazing in the process and helped patch all the systems. We ended up patching several hundred million devices in a 22 hour period uh, to help remove the vulnerability. And within a weekend, we had gone from non-discovery to full patch management in 22 hours. Very difficult to QA that process to be successful. If there was a mistake along the way, you could reach massive infrastructure in a quick period of time. One of that McAfee, we released a faulty DAT, some of you might know. It was called 5958. We sent the DAT out. It uh, quarantined a boot executable on Windows uh, Service Pack 2. And we took down 3 million computers in 16 minutes over, I think, 1,600 companies. So the accident problem, coupled with some of the crime and sabotage and espionage, sort of creating a very interesting dark side to the scenarios we're facing. So again, sorry to be too ominous here, but we've got to think about how do we close the defense and the offense? This is probably the number one task that I think as a community of security professionals, we have to figure out what can we do to get it back to very incremental offense and defense activity. Right now, that gap is enormous. The power, the money, the complexity versus what the defense can do is too great. And it's going to create what I just showed you as a problem. So as you think about this evolution, you know, we had the birth of antivirus. As you started to see those first types of virus attacks occurred, many of you know Code Red, Melissa, I love you viruses, things like that. I remember tracking some of those. Of course, my favorite person, John McAfee, you guys remember this guy? Um, he's, he helped invent that. And uh, of course, uh, I think he's now involved with security again, but a little scary. Um, but nonetheless, we've seen a huge evolution of the types of offense and types of malware creation that's being used. And of course, the defense keeps trying to follow along. In years past, particularly in the last 10 years, we've seen a pretty close correlation. Right about the time we started to see advanced persistent threats, nation state activity at a much higher level, we saw that dislocation change dramatically. And that really obsoleted a lot of the technology that I had talked about before, everything from blacklisting using antivirus to blacklisting using data loss prevention, intrusion detection systems, uh, blacklisting of web URLs, just about everything there began to break apart as we watched the model move forward. So where are we at today? We now have to figure out a way to do a different type of analysis, a different way to think about things. And it's exacerbated by the fact that almost all the offense is using darknet domains to start and infiltrate their attacks. And I'll show you in just a second, almost 100% of the attacks will start with the visible web. How do I lure you to click on a website? How do I start an exploit to occur? But then all the command and control server activity is all happening in the darknet. Stuff that's protected by password, stuff that's highly encrypted, none of which is using standard cryptography, most of which is using anonymity to hide behind. And ultimately, we have a lot of combinations here between the visible net and the internet to access it. So what are the attackers trying to focus on? Here's what we see almost the number one area the attackers will do first. The offensive model typically starts with going after high tech. Almost all the cases that we see, the large campaigns that are launched, most of them came from an attack on the high tech sector first. What do I mean by that? Typically it happened where a startup company, a cloud-based company, uh, whether it's an Adobe or an Oracle or a Microsoft or an Apple or a Google or something like that or a smaller company, the APTs were put in place to go after critical source code, uh, some sort of digital trust certificate, something to gain access to the core of the application as, as unknown as possible. Once we have access to that, we can start to put technology in place that has much longer persistency than any other types of malware that could be used. So a huge number of the attack vectors we're seeing measured in hundreds and hundreds of companies come from this type of attack. Gain access to the bug database, the source code, learn how to load a DLL, 
try to do something that enables it to be uh, invisible to the, uh, the current systems, leverage that vulnerability, use an exclusive or some sort of polymorphic technique, and then stage it over time. Maybe in the first instance, it's used to download the exploit. It wakes up a couple weeks later. It takes another command, and then ultimately creating a multi-staged attack over a period of time, sometimes lasting years as we move forward. So what do they ultimately do? They'll leverage it across multiple vectors in the architecture. Uh, it can come in through five different domains we tend to see. A lot of it is now moved into the bring your own device area, your smartphone, or some side of take home device. Uh, this area is probably most prevalent today, particularly with the Google platform. I think we're now up over 90% of the attacks are emanated from the, uh, from the Android platform into a spearfish, not just with email, but now into the mobile. Of course, it's attacking in multiple areas. And what's happened is that Maginot architecture that we have is exploited because these products don't work well together. They don't communicate from one to another. And it creates holes in the architecture as we move forward. Pretty interesting scenario. If you look at the types of attacks that occur, these are the stages we typically see. Stage one, drop an exploit in, understand how to get it to a unique individual in the room, load that exploit down to your device, put it in memory, start to communicate back to a command and control server, load down cryptography, work back and forth with a command and control server, and then ultimately create encrypted data exfiltration commands. That creates probably the most powerful. Ultimately, they're gonna erase that malware if they can, and then create valid credential login. If we can get the combination of getting the exploit in, erasing the malware, and then logging in validly for a long period of time, it creates the architecture we have today, on average 243 days unknown. So a pretty interesting model keeps evolving with these attackers. This is a global cyber threat map, kind of illustrate the picture, if you can see it in the back. This map here shows how many command and control servers we're monitoring every day. We're now up to about 60 million command and control servers globally, all using the dark net components that I described earlier most of which are using APTs to talk back and forth to the servers. Uh, on an average day, we're seeing somewhere in the neighborhood of a few hundred thousand new exploits occur, somewhere in the neighborhood of a few million command and control server communications, and it targets somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, I think it's 90% in the high-tech sector initially, and then ultimately emanating out to multiple verticals. So as you kind of watch this map occur, you'll start to see that this APT model that we're using is cutting across over 200 countries as well. So pretty powerful combinations where multi-staged attacks coming in, lasting for hundreds of days, cutting across the globe, hundreds of thousands of unique communications. And of course, most of this is very difficult to track who the actual adversary is. You can see some of the numbers that are up there. One particular point to make, 67% of what we tracked were from known good command and control servers as well. This is the, their own website in some cases. The first hop is often a water hold website from the company that's being infected. Uh, we've made a couple of those uh, famous with some of the blogs, but in the case of like a Target or some others, the actual site, the website itself, was actually the launch point for the command and control server activity initially. Then ultimately it became a dark net type of command and control server. Give you a kind of an idea of some of the uh, APT campaigns that we're seeing across the board, high tech to defense, to telecom and so forth. These APTs are common across many verticals when they're first deployed. Some of you probably know Ghost Rat, uh, a couple others, uh, uh, B Bus, I'll talk about in a second, but they're very migratory. So once we see them in one sector, we'll see them cut across many, many industries in a pretty quick period of time. Here's the example I just mentioned Operation B Bus. Uh, some of you know this, B Bus. This was on the defense industrial base uh, about a year ago or so. It was targeted the UAVs. This is the unmanned aerial vehicles. 
the uh, attack initially came in from China, uh, initially linked with APT-1, but the idea there was to spearfish, get an APT in, steal from the AutoCAD repository, gain access to the UAV information, and then ultimately we've now seen that activity permeate in replicated UAVs uh, in the marketplace in China with some of their defense industrial base, and of course the idea there is to keep up with the latest defense technology. Five stages of attack, multiple hops of command and control servers, several hundred days undetected, and ultimately arriving in a very successful attack me uh, mechanism. So when you look at the big four superpowers, just to kind of wrap it up in summary here, you'll see we have a lot happening. In the China origin, we now have 22 groups we're tracking uh, across the Army, Navy, uh, People's Liberation Army, uh, Third Bureau, uh, MSS. These organizations are highly focused in on uh, areas of espionage and activity. Rarely do we see for crime activities related to dollars and financials. Most of the activity is to feed the emerging markets. In the Middle East, we're seeing similar activities, Russia similar activities, uh, most of which are gaining momentum every couple of weeks, every couple of months, and resulting in pretty successful attacks. Uh, if you sort of look at the Chinese playbook a little closer, you'll see not only is the activities focused entirely on innovation and high tech, but now it's pretty viral around the world as well, not just on the US markets. We're seeing an incredible amount of activity in Japan, incredible activity in Germany, uh, some of the higher innovation countries, lots of focus in that region. And as you start to look at the strategy, low profile, deniability, trying to orchestrate this across teams, and of course, a lot of pretty known attacks have occurred in a pretty quick period of time, some of which I, I mentioned here. These are some of the famous hackers that were indicted in the uh, Pittsburgh federal court, some of which uh, are very active to this day, none of which will actually see uh, a court, I'm sure, but uh, pretty interesting for the first time in history, we're seeing the indictment of Chinese military officers. In my opinion, we'll see an equal and opposite reaction occur sometime in the next couple of months. Maybe we're already going to see it, but this event here will create uh, a pretty interesting uh, whiplash back to the U.S. markets, in my opinion. When you look at Russia, similar activity, tremendous activity focused on crime, lots of focus coming out of the Ukrainian markets, Crimean markets, uh, Russian business network markets in St. Petersburg. A lot of focus in on high, um, high volume, low dollar types of activities, particularly with the equity markets, credit card markets, debit card markets. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting personnel involved here. Uh, one of my favorite uh, was some of the botnets that were brought down and a particular letter that was used. Probably can't see it back there, but um, this was a letter back to FireEye after we brought down their botnet. And of course, what's the saying? Like, what are you doing? Why are you bringing down this botnet? You have no ability to affect the, uh, the outcome of this. There's no criminal prosecution. We're protected by the government. And uh, this is a waste of time, basically. So interesting to watch the protectionism that's occurring from the governments in most of these criminal activities. And another example of that uh, we just watched with Target and a few other major uh, retailers. Middle East, similar much more focused on kind of geopolitical activities. We've seen a tremendous amount of activity coming from the SEA recently, uh, as well as Ajax Security Group in Iran. Uh, again, sabotage focused, a lot of activity targeted towards high sensationalism of critical infrastructure. Uh, again, a focus on uh, destruction as much as possible. Uh, we've seen a number of these. Uh, some of these are pretty famous. You probably know them, Ras Gas, Aramco, some of the mole rat activities that occurred as well. And then most recently, the big casinos. So as you think about all this activity that's occurring, you know, what are we finding? Highly persistent actors, highly polymorphic activities, leveraging all these new domains that are occurring, multi-staged attacks, very interesting, you know, zero-day types of leverage from source code and high-tech actors. And environments, and ultimately we've created a very different threat landscape over the next few years than we've been seeing in the past. 
So part of what I try to communicate when I come to these events is how do we think about changing the way in which we do security? How do we begin to unite the communities that we have together? Products won't solve this. We won't be able to close the gap immediately with a product, but if we can improve the learnings and the people and the expertise, couple that with the products, put together a better process, we probably can close the gap a little closer than we have it today. So with that, I just want to say I think we're seeing a change occur, a pretty big shift. I think we have to reimagine some of this. This is what we're trying to do at FireEye is focus in on a whole new generation of technology using virtual machines. The idea there is to create a much stronger learning environment for attacks. Not only know what's going on from uh, known attacks, but also unknown and zero-day type of attacks and be able to put these virtual machines in nearly every area of the architecture, from the web to email to file to mobile, and ultimately through to endpoints. If we can put a different type of model than antivirus in place and have it learn from each other, we can probably create a better architecture to be proactive with the intelligence, be much faster at the attack learning, and then leverage that across the globe quickly. So we believe that creates a, a nice change from where we were before with antivirus. All right, you guys still there? All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, and thanks for your time. All right. Oh, cool. I get official t-shirt. Shirt. Thank you. Nice. Ah, thank you, Jason. Thank you so Fire Eye Red, too? Kara, we just have to get him to wear it at work. I will. I'll wear it now. Did you want to... Should we do questions, or...? Do you guys have any questions for Dave? Anything we can answer? Oh, we got one. Love it. Let me do run around and...